Okay. So, let's see if this works. Um, please let me know if you can't see the screen. So problem one asked, how many two digit positive integers n satisfy pi to the n equals one? Um, so we know that i to the four equals one, i to the eight equals one, so on. So basically all um, n that are multiples of four will um, produce i, equal, i to the n equals one. Um, so the two digit multiples of, of four are 12, 16, all the way until 96. And if we divide all of these by four, we can find that there are um, 24 minus three plus one equals 22 of these numbers. Okay. Um, and let, let me know if we're going too fast or too slow, or if you have any questions. Okay. All right, so now let's look at number two. which asks, what is the sum of all possible c such that one minus two i is 17 units away from nine plus c i? So in order to find the distance between the two points, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So we know that they have to be 17 units away. So 17 squared equals the difference between the, um, on the real axis will be one minus nine squared. And then the difference on the imaginary axis will be minus two um, minus C squared. And now we can just solve this for C. And um, if you look at it, one minus nine, equals eight. So this is actually an eight, 15, 17 right triangle. And that means that minus two minus C squared equals 17 squared. So we have two possibilities, either minus two minus C equals 17, which gives C equals um, negative 19 or um, the other one is negative two minus C equals negative 17, in which case C equals 15. So the sum of all possible C will be negative 19 plus 15 or four. Okay. Um, let's move on to problem three. And please let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, this one, you kind of just have to calculate it out. Um, so we'll start from the most innermost fraction. Um, all right. So it's one over one plus one over one plus one over one minus one plus i. So let's worry about the first um, 
one at the bottom. Um, if we multiply the top and bottom of one plus one over one plus i by its conjugate, we get um, for this denominator, it turns out to be one minus one minus i over um, one plus one, which will be um, which turns out to be one plus i over two. So that's what this denominator equals. Um, next, we calculate this denominator. And that's 1 plus the reciprocal of this. 1 plus 2 over 1 plus i. And again, we multiply by the conjugate of the complex number. And in this time, we get 1 plus 2 over 1 minus i over 2. And if you simplify everything, this is 2 minus i. So that's what this denominator equals. And now we'll go to the um, final denominator under the big fraction. So that is 1 plus 1 over 2 minus i. And we multiply by the conjugate of the complex number once more. So th that gives us 1 plus 2 plus i over 4 plus 1. Or equivalent, equivalently, 7 plus i over 5. OK, and now we take the reciprocal of the entire thing. And that's 5 over 7 plus i. And of course, now we have to rational not, um, not rationalize, um, remove the complex number from the denominator. So we multiply by the conjugate once again, and um, which is 7 minus i in this case. So on the Numerator, we have 35 minus 5i. And in the denominator, we have 49 plus 1. So overall, the number will be 35 over 50 minus 5 over 50i. And it wants the answer, it wants, um, a plus B, which will be 35 over 50 minus 5 over 50, which is equal to 3 fifths. So just a lot of computation in this one, um, but it's good practice for clearing the denominator and multiplying by the conjugate. All right, so moving on to Problem number four. Which was to find all complex numbers z such that z minus two, uh, the magnitude of z minus two equals the magnitude of z plus one. So, for this one, let's write z in terms of a plus b. Um, that means that now we can write this equation as a minus 2 plus bi equals a plus 1 um, plus bi. So the distances are the same. So we have the same imaginary term. So we can just ignore that and focus on the real terms, which are different. So if the distances are the same, that means that um, a minus 2 squared equals a plus 1 squared. And um, 
now we just solve this equation for a and we can't just take the square root of both sides because that would get rid of one possible solution so instead we move all the terms to one side and this is now a difference of squares so we can factor it as such a minus two plus a plus one times a minus two minus a minus one equals zero. And this one, in this one, the a's cancel out. So we'll just focus on this one. And this will give us two a equals one or a equals one half. And it wanted all complex numbers z such that um, this equation is true. So that would mean that it's all, all z with real part equal to one half. And this will be the answer. Um, another, this, this is a very good way to solve this problem. Um, however, you can also solve it in a geometric way as in you can try to draw out like a point at 2i and a point at negative i that is like given from the equation and then you can find try to find all points where the imaginary point would be the same distance to those two points 2i negative 1i and that gives off the same answer also because the abs the magnitude of the number is the length of the line right So, um, okay, let's move on to problem five. And find the number of complex numbers A such that A plus A to the 2020 was zero. Uh, so for this one, um, first factor out a, and now you have a times one plus a to the twenty nineteen was zero. So um, so we know a equals zero is one solution, and so whatever a that fits this is another solution. And because of the complex roots, the complex roots theorem, um, we know that there are 2019 distinct roots to this equation here. So overall in total, there are just 2019 plus one equals 2020 roots. So this is a more conceptual problem, um, but it's good demonstration anyway. Okay, so now let's take a look at problem six. All right, so in problem six, we're looking at a region A in the complex plane that consists consists of all points Z, such that both Z over 40 and 40 over the conjugate of Z have real and imaginary parts between zero and one inclusive. And we're trying to find the area of A, basically. So first, we'll look at Z over 40. And before we begin, let's just write down Z as A plus B I. So, and if that's the case, then Z over 40 would be A over 40 plus B over 40 I. And then we don't, we want the these two coefficients, a over 40 and b over 40, to be between 0 and 1. So that means a and b must both be 
between zero and 40. So on our complex plane here, um, there would have to be, oh, this is not the complex plane actually. Um, let's just say this is A and this is B. Um, there would have to be inside of this box. So this is the area in which um, the co the co the real and ima imaginary parts of this number would be between zero and one. So now let's turn to the other one, 40 over the conjugate of Z. And the conjugate of Z is A minus B I. So now let's try to Um, remove the complex, the uh, imaginary part from the denominator. So we multiply by the conjugate once more and we get a squared plus b squared over 40a plus 40bi. So the real part will be 40a over a squared plus b squared. And we want this to be less than one, but greater than zero. And um, since we already know that a has to be more than zero, we'll just focus on the less than one part for now. And that gives us, if we multiply the top and bottom by a squared plus b squared, um, that gives us 40a is less than a squared plus b squared. And now we can move 40a to this side and complete the square. So if we do that, we get a minus 20 squared plus b squared. And we also now have to add a 400 to this side. Um, and that means this is a circle with radius 20 and it's at the point a, it's centered at the point a equals 20 and b equals zero, which would be right here. And that means If not, it's a semicircle like this. So is the region inside the semicircle, um, does it satisfy the condition or no? So to find that out, we can just uh, plug in a point and see if it holds. So let's check the point 20, A equals 20, B equals 10, which would be somewhere around here. And if we plug that in, we get that 400 is less than 10 squared which is false. So that means that the area inside this does not satisfy the condition. And this was for A or the real part. If we take the imaginary part and do a similar thing, it'll produce a circle that's centered at on the B axis here. And similarly, it will look like this. Um, and as with A, it's the area outside that satisfies the condition. So the area that we're trying to find is now this part here. Um, and this is now a geometry problem. So to make this easier, we can split it up into two shapes. So if you do this, now we have a square and that has area um, 20 squared. Uh, actually, first, the area of the big square will be 40 squared, and we're subtracting this much, this amount here. So the, this square was 20 squared, and we also have the 
um, quarter circles here. And if we add them together, they form a semicircle, which has area half 20 squared pi. And basically now you just have to um, do out the math. The, there's a pi in it, but the problem wants it in terms of the um, nearest integer. And if you do that out, you should come up with 572. That's a pretty long one. Um, there's, does anyone have any questions about that one or not? So we can move on to number seven. Um, and this one is asking how many unique solutions are there to x to the 15 minus 1 times x to the 15 plus 1 equals 0. Um, so this is a difference of squares, or not squares, but um, if we multiply it out, we get x to the 30 minus 1 equals 0. <laughs> and yeah, it's just asking for the roots of unity for 30. And that means there are 30 solutions. 30 complex solutions. All right. So now let's go to the next one, problem eight. I'm sorry. Okay, so this one is asking to find C if C equals A plus B I cubed minus 107 I. So first what we do is we expand this uh, binomial cubed here and that gives us A cubed plus three A squared B I and then minus three a b squared and then again minus b cubed i and let's bring the 107 i to this side so c plus 107 i equals and let's rearrange the thing so that all the reals are together. Um, a cubed minus three a b squared plus three a squared b minus b cubed i. Uh, this one has a i. So For these two numbers to be equal, both the real and the imaginary parts have to be the same. So that means C equals this real part here. And I'm also going to factor it, A squared minus B squared. And the imaginary parts also have to match up. So 107 equals, um, and I'm also going to factor this one, 3a squared minus b squared. OK, so now let's first take a look at the 107 equation. So 107 is a prime number. And the problem says that a, b, and c are all positive integers. So the only factors of 107 are 1 and 107 itself. So that means one of these is 107 and the other one of these is one. Um, let's try B equals one first. If that's the case, then this is 107. And that means that A equals six. And if we just plug this back in, we have C equals six times 
um, 36 minus one or C times 35 equals 210. Hope, no, wait. Oh, I forgot the three here. That's why this is wrong. Okay. Um, let me get my eraser. Okay, so this is actually six times 33, which is 198. Okay, any questions about this one? Okay, um, let's keep going then. Uh, next is number nine. Okay, and this one it's asking, um, first it gives us A and B. A is 20 plus 40i, B is negative 14 plus ci. And if A over B is a purely imaginary number, what is C? Okay, so A over B would be 20 plus 40i over 14 plus c of i. So let's get rid of the imaginary numbers in the denominator um, by multiplying by the conjugate. And that would give us 196 plus c squared. And on top, that is equal to 20 plus 40i minus 14 minus ci. And in order to continue, we multiply the binomials together. And that would be negative 280 minus 560i minus 20ci plus 40c. And if the number resulting from a divided by b is purely imaginary, that means that the real part has to equal zero. So in other words, that means that negative 280 plus 40c has to equal zero. And that means that c equals seven. Any questions so far? And we can also try to skip ahead to a later problem if you want, if any of you guys want to. Okay. Um, we'll go on to problem 10. All right, so starts off by saying that there are 24 solutions to the equation z to the 24 equals one. And these are just the roots of unity for n equals 24. Um, Okay, so let's let R be a root of this. Um, in that case, R would be, um, we know from the roots of unity that R is uh, CIS 
2 pi k over 24. And then it's asking if the solutions um, if any of those solutions z to the 6 would be a real number. Um, so in that case, r to the 6 equals, actually, I guess this is kind of confusing. Um, so let's just use z. All right, so in that case, z to the 6 would be cis 6 times 2 pi k over 24. Um, and if we like write this out and expand it, it's cosine um, pi k over 2 plus i sine pi k over 2. So for it to be a real number, um, the imaginary part with the sign has to equal zero. And that happens when, in a couple of places, so when k equals zero, um, sine of zero is zero. When k equals two, sine of pi is equal to zero. Sine of four is sine two pi, which is also equal zero. Basically so on. So all the even k will produce a sign that's equal to zero. And that means that um, half of the roots will have only have a real part when they're taken to the sixth power. So the answer would be 12. Okay. Uh, let's move on to number 11 now. <laughs> So this one is asking for the sum of the roots of z to the 12 um, equals 64 that have a positive real part. So all right, so we know that r, let's let r be the radius in the polar form. Um, So that means z would be root two because 64 to the one over 12 equals root two. Um, root two cosine two pi k over 12 plus i sine 2 pi k over um, 12. And we're looking for real, uh, real values only. So we want the sign part here to be zero. And so let's go through the k's and see which ones are equal to zero. Um, So first there's zero because sine of zero is zero. And then one. Um, oh wait, I'm sorry, a, a positive real part. Uh, so we're looking for spots where cosine of Oh, this cosine is positive, actually. Sorry, um, I messed that up. Uh, so, but still, k equals zero is uh, produces cosine of one, which is positive, and then one gives us cosine of pi over six or cosine of thirty, which is uh, one half, and then k equals two gives us cosine of pi over three which is 
um, root three over two, still positive. But then for three, um, it's now cosine of pi over two, which is zero. And then if you think about the unit circle, we're now um, onto the opposite side of the circle now. So for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they are all on this side. And that means that cosine will be negative. And then for 10 and 11, we're back on the positive x axis. So they also work. So now um, we have to find the sum of these that work. Um, 0, 1, 2, and then 10 and 11. So for 1 and 2 and 10 and 11, they're both, they're basically opposite points on the unit circle. So that means that the i's will all cancel. And for 0, the sine of 0 is 0 anyway. So we only have to worry about the cosine part. So first off, we have root 2 plus 2, because these have the same x values, so it will have the same values. Um, so that's 2 times root 2 times 1 half plus root 3 over 2 times root 2. And if you add that all up, we get 2 root 2 plus root 6. Okay, any questions about this one? Okay, um, I think we have time for a few more problems actually. Number 12 is um, probably one of the more complex ones. All right, so a complex number z is selected uniformly at random such that its distance from the origin is 1. And then compute the probability that both z and z to the 2019 are both lie in quadrant 2 of the complex plane. So, um, we're choosing a random complex number z. So let's let the angle of the complex number be theta. Uh, first off, uh, we'll also define alpha equals pi over 4038 for convenience. And that means um, first of all, the z has to be in quadrant two. And in case you need to review, quadrant two is in the upper left hand corner. Uh, yeah. So in order for theta to be in quadrant two, it has to be between pi over 2 and pi. Or if we write it in terms of theta, that will be 2019 theta. And 4038 alpha. alpha. OK, so next let's look at uh, z to the 2019. Um, So the, from De Moivre's theorem, the angle of that will be 2019 theta. And for some like multiple of two pi, it's still in between pi and pi over two plus two pi k. So, uh, we'll do some m manipulations on these sides. 
Uh, first of all, pull out pi over two from both. And that gives us pi over two times one plus four K. And on the upper bound, that's pi over two times two plus four K. Then we can divide both sides by 2019. And because we said alpha is pi over 4038, we can simplify things by writing it terms of alpha. All right, so now we have this. Okay, so earlier we found that 2019 alpha minus theta, uh, I mean, it's less than theta, is less than 4038 alpha. So this is still true. And also at the same time, this is also true. So that means we have a few intervals where um, this holds for theta. The first one will be, let's go to another new page. First, we need a multiple of four. So 2020 is one. The first one will start at 2021. And um, this one is just one more than this one. So it goes until 2021 alpha and 2022 um, alpha. So that's one interval where it works. The next interval will be the next power of four, which is 2024 plus one. So 2025 alpha until the next one, 2026 alpha, and all the way until uh, we reach the upper bound, um, which is 4036 alpha and 4037 alpha. Okay, so let's count the number of intervals there are. Um, first, we can subtract all the numbers by one. 2020, uh, 2024, 4030. This is supposed to be seven. This is eight. Sorry. And divide everything by four. 505, 506, 1009. And that means there are 1009 minus 505 plus one equals 505 intervals. So each interval has, um, is like alpha, has a distance of, has a length length of alpha. Um, so that means in total, there is like 505 alpha places for the, Um, 2019 theta to be in the quadrant two. And in total, um, there are like two pi radians to choose theta from. So we calculate this thing out and um, the pi's cancel out. And overall, we end up with 505 over 800, no, 8,076. Oh, so it's pretty um, involved problem. It still works out pretty nicely in the end. Uh, are there any questions at this point? And you can also send them to Kevin as well. Okay, so I think we'll probably do one more problem and um, that'll be it. So let's look at number 13. So there are two numbers Z and W. Z13 equals W. 
and W11 OZ. Um, so this one is actually a lot simpler than it seems. We're trying to find the imaginary part of Z. And But first, basically, what we can do is plug in z to the 13 for w here. So that would be z to the 13 to the 11 equals z, or in other words, z to the 143 equals z. Now we have uh, this equation, which we can factor z out of. And this is now the um, complex roots of negative one. So we know that if that's the case, then the um, roots are just going to be z equals whatever r is, and then cis 2 pi k over the exponent 142. And for simplifying down, that's uh, pi, pi k over 71. And we're trying to find n, which is a denominator. And the denominator will always be 71 because k ranges from 0 to 70, but 71 is prime. So none of the, the fraction won't ever be simplified. And then, so the answer is just 71. Okay. I think this is a good stopping point. Um, we'll be back tomorrow talking about algebra techniques. Um, and we have like a Zoom game that we've planned for that. Um, so be sure to come back for that. Um, it's going to be like knockout in basketball um, if, you have, if you've ever played that. So it should be pretty fun. And we'll also do some um, fancy algebra examples. OK. Um, so thank you all for coming. Before we leave, do you guys want to do some kind of check-in real quick? So if you want, you can um, just say one good thing that happened this week. Mm, one um i think one good thing this week was really like <laughs> the doing the aoi me it was just fun to solve problems okay um something good that happened for me this week was i baked banana bread yesterday and it was really tasty. Oh, nice. Um, really I actually bake brownies every week. Anyone else want to go? <laughs>